You might catch yourself sliding in and out of You might catch yourself sliding in and out of a hallucinatory state. Do, just relax and enjoy it. Do, just relax and enjoy it. This is an experiment, this is an experiment in, mind in mind formation. In formation. In formation. Forming, forming, controlling, controlling, operating your, operating mind, your and mind and your brain. We're using digital We're using techniques, digital techniques to, overload, to overload, scramble, scramble, scramble confuse, confuse, unfocus, unfocus your, mind, your mind. The natural state of the brain is chaos. Chaos, chaos is beautiful. Is beautiful. Daniel Ingram, good to have you back, man. What's up? Great to be here. I'm excited to be talking with you today and talking about one of my favorite things in the whole world, the EPRC. Man, I am excited to talk to you about it. I was kind of pouring through the white paper for the past couple of weeks and just going through stuff, and it's a lot to take in. Yes, it is. That is true. It's it's quite the elaborate plan, but that's been developed in conversation with a lot of people over a lot of time and a lot of good minds helping us with that. So what was the emergence? of the Emergent Phenomena Research Consortium. When when did this whole idea come into play? Yeah, so a little over five years ago, some friends of mine, Dr. Julieta Galante and Andrea Grabovac and Tim Reed and maybe a few other people were in a little Slack group where they were trying to figure out how to operationalize. They were thinking about like insight stages and stuff like that and figuring out how to operationalize that in clinical practice in a more skillful way to help um, clinicians and therapists have a better appreciation of the highs, lows, weirds, and stuff that can arise on the path. And they invited me to join that group. And then Dr. Julieta Galante, who's an MD, PhD with a public health degree, who was a senior postdoc at Cambridge University working on some outpatient clinical mindfulness meditation effects. She said, Daniel, why don't you come here to Cambridge and spend the summer? And that was the summer of, let's see here, when was that? Uh, 2019, I guess. And she said, why don't you spend the summer here and see if we can help get this project off the ground. And I had this remarkable networks of friends that I had talked with about meditation. And some of them were like, hey, Daniel, what are you doing this summer? I'm like, oh, Dr. Galante invited me to help get this project off the ground and, and help see you know, how we do this. And they were like, wow, where do we sign and how do we help? And a bunch of them also happened to be like neuroscientists at Harvard and Yale and MIT and Brown and Vanderbilt and Berkeley and Stanford and Oxford and and all kinds of other excellent universities who just didn't necessarily have such fancy names. And before we knew it, uh, we were the EPRC. And so um, there it was. That's kind of the, the the quick version of the origin story. I love that. That's awesome. So to just give people some some background and just kind of bring them up to speed on what the EPRC is and what the EPRC's mission and goal is, you want to just give some insight on that? Yeah, so the EPRC, the Emergent Phenomenology Research Consortium, is uh, now, I think, about 260 people dedicated to upgrading the relationship between the deep end of human experience, relatively broadly defined, what most people would call spiritual, mystical, magical, energetic, and psychedelic phenomena, mm. and we would call emergent phenomena. So they upgrade the relationship between that and the clinical public health, mental health mainstreams, as well as the scientific mainstream kind of by default. Right on. So yeah, to help, you know, I mean, my my muggly clinician friends did not go into this to be ignorant and harmful when it comes to this stuff, but unfortunately, sometimes can be and can needlessly pathologize, prescribe meds, say you're broken for life. That is not helpful. There's no healing potential from that strange thing you're going through. That is just all bad. Let's shut it down. And I, I wish I were. I wish that were not true, and I wish that my relatively scathing and pretty quickly dismissive summary of the clinical mainstream when it comes to this stuff were not as accurate as it is, but unfortunately, that is pretty much the state of the art. I just re-reviewed the textbooks of emergency medicine and psychiatry, and they're pretty much as bad as when I trained 20 years ago or so. <laughs> and so, you know, because I did clinical practice for about 12 years and was a resident in a medical school and all those things. And... um yeah, and they really haven't moved much. And everybody thinks, oh, of course, they're evolving with the psychedelic renaissance and evolving with all this meditation stuff. And of course, they they know how to handle all. The no, they don't. And there are no diagnostic codes that are useful pretty much in ICD-11, the World Health Organization. There's pretty much nothing useful except a few vague sentences in the DSM-5 TR that are like, 
basically, if you're having hallucinations, delusions, mania, bipolar, schizophrenia, or whatever, and your particular spiritual tradition thinks this is okay and you're otherwise functional, maybe this is mental illness, but there's almost no, there's not really appropriate diagnostic codes for that. There's there's no almost no justification to really hang your hat on if something goes wrong from a standards of care point of view. And nobody really wrote the phone book of what the exceptions might be that could give some justification to a, a you know, even a really well-meaning clinical practitioner to be able to do something other than say is crazy needs meds. So, um, and then also appreciating the healing and transformative potentials in terms of how to cultivate these states of mind, how to do this in a skillful way, how to balance risks, benefits, and alternatives, how to think about how to cultivate the resiliences, the upgrades of consciousness, the, the, you know, the sort of shock absorbers for the stuff the world can throw at you and, and the beneficial insights that can come with deep practice. Those aren't well flushed out either in the clinical mainstream, obviously. They've got pretty much, there's mindfulness and it just makes you a little nicer and a little better and it doesn't cause any side effects. Shh. Um, so, <laughs> no, and then psychedelics, wow, they're going to be great for everybody, but, you know. Maybe not. <laughs> yeah, it's sometimes yes, sometimes no. It's a little more nuanced than that. And so it's a pretty strange time right now and definitely not a very sophisticated time for the clinical mainstream. And our job is to give them what they need to do way better in their mandate to add value to care, to not do harm, to give people informed consent on the risk benefits and alternatives of whatever they're doing based on high quality data, and to scale this globally. So those are the basic foundations of medical ethics, which are the foundations of the EPRC. And based on those, we do what we do. Right on. So when we're talking about spiritual practice, we're going to basically, we're going to be substituting the word emergent for spiritual. That, that, that's kind of one of the linguistic things that we have to deal with here. Because it, spiritual, uh, mystical, meditative, same, all same kind of different. Shamanic, indigenous. <laughs> you no, know, but these things can happen in a lot of contexts. I knew people who got into this in a breath, breath workshop and acting to like be able to hit, you know, he have people in the back of the room hear them. And that was enough meditation controlling their breath. They got into wild openings. I know people who had these experiences in childbirth or like, you know, playing sports or in military right. situations where they were on a very intense watch and paying really careful attention to what was going on, you know, and who might be creeping through the dark or whatever. And that got them in enough meditative clarity to to have these experiences. So they can happen in a lot of contexts. Right. And yeah. We care about however they happen. Yeah. And, and I love that because, you know, just as you were saying, these experiences just happen. Like there doesn't have to sure. be any necessarily like a catalyst, you know, people... I've you know heard of people like sitting for five minutes with like waking up or something and oh, yeah. this experience and it's like oh well you just you know you you just led yourself to this point all paths lead to here, and so like there doesn't necessarily need to be a practice involved there doesn't need to be any outside really like I, I'm going for this spiritual goal or anything like that this stuff happens all the time just out of the blue yeah absolutely right okay so building off of that. You know, I, I consider myself a pretty seasoned uh, meditation practitioner. Um, you obviously are one yourself. And so for us, people who are familiar with, you know, progress of insight and these things that these experiences that can come up on this journey, so to speak, on this path, these aren't really new territory for us. But for right. people who, you know, say the the person doing the the singing class and just focus on their breath just enough, like that can be a little, a uh, little much for them to take in. Like they have no no idea what's even happening and so like i i totally understand why this this whole eprc would be formed and and it's really amazing work that you guys are doing but it's Thanks. it's kind of, it's kind of funny that you know people get into meditation like you said and they're like oh it'll be relaxing and i'll be more productive and it's like oh slow down <laughs> <laughs> slow down sometimes sometimes those, those are things that can sometimes happen that's that can be a, one of the effects but there's also this whole range and spectrum of other things that can come up you know just with arising and passing away, dark night stuff, certainly, which yeah. I, I, you know, as we've talked about before, like I've dealt with ad nauseum until very recently. So I love what you guys are doing. And I love that you're under the blanket of the EPRC. There's so many different projects as well. Like each, oh, yes. each little thing has its own project. And I love that. I think Anna Lucagis was involved with the, the psychedelic project that you guys are doing. And uh, I still haven't talked to her, by the way, not, not recently. So. Oh yeah, you got it. Yeah. Good. But yeah. Um, so that being said, the EPRC is this blanket for all of these different practices. There's uh, the phenomenology, the neurophenomenology, the psychedelic practice, and 
blah, 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 on and on and on and on. And so yep. where there's all this overlap, you know, and what, what one man's meditation path is another man's psychosis, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> and sometimes both. Right. right. And exactly. and some people intentionally cultivate that. So when we go on fire casino retreats and are intentionally cultivating the ability to see things that most people would not see there, though sometimes occasionally people can, uh, you know, is that psychosis when we're intentionally invoking entities and then seeing and hearing them? Like, it's kind of like psychosis, but in some ways it really isn't. Right. right. It, it doesn't have that generally life ruining feature that psychosis often does. So you know, figuring out what is psychosis and what is valid spiritual attainment or whatever, like is is often a question not only of context, but also of function, of intention, of tolerance, of appreciation. There's a lot of things that can go into how you think about where you draw the line between the one and the other. And and this is going to be an ongoing debate for a very long time. We don't think we're suddenly going to sort this out, but we think we can end a lot of nuance to the conversation to give people options. That's the hope, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it's interesting because when we, we talk about psychosis or, you know, I've, I've known people who have had, you know, this spiritual awakening or whatever you want to call it, this emergent phenomenon, basically. And, you know, people have kind of pointed, the, you know, been like, oh, it seems like they're experiencing psychosis. And I was actually listening to another, uh, an interview the other day, and I can't remember exactly who it was with, but they were like, well, what's the important distinction between psychosis and spiritual awakening is like, are they happy? <laughs> you know, like that might be Kinda, a good although, place. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting one. And actually trying to figure out what the criteria are that would differentiate this is not easy. Right. So for example, like, are they happy? So are they happy is not always necessarily a good one because some people could be super happy like during their high, right? But they could also be super weird and dysfunctional. Right. <laughs> um, and point. so then questions of function and questions of tolerance for dysfunction. So dysfunction can look very different in the trust fund kid who can take a, a month off to lay on a beach and stare at the stars versus the single mom who's got like 2.3 kids and 1.5 jobs and can't doesn't have the... The numbers I use all the time, but doesn't have the the bandwidth to tolerate disruptions in their you know function, and they have responsibilities and care responsibilities, and people with aging parents and debts and in school and critical jobs, like they they might have very very narrow tolerance windows for disruption of their life in any form, and so what one person to might be like just fine, and they can lay on the beach seeing the spirits and you know, cruising the the cosmic whatever, and other people like they just don't have the the capacity for that. So so sometimes these things might be sort of semi contextual, and the ability to have the nuance to think about that, and then to work with a patient or a practitioner or an experience or whoever they are, and say, hey, what are we trying to do here? What are your goals right now? What do you need? And to be able to meet them in a skillful way, in an ethical way is something that we hope that we will expand the clinical mainstream's ability to do. That would, that again, that is the hope, right? Is just getting this information more widely known. And it's like, hey, these these are experiences that happen. You know, yes. there's many ways to get there, but there's also, wait, you don't even have to try to get there. There's people who, it just happens all the time, all the yep. time. Uh, how, yeah. So what is the the rate of that? Like uh, you probably have much more information on that than I do. Like as far as the EPRC is concerned, like how how often do you, like at least in your experience, do you get people coming to you and be like, hey, I've just been having these weird experiences and then it turns out to be some sort of emergent phenomenon? Well, um, depending on how you want to address the question of how common these are. So maybe something like 50% of people have seen a ghost. If you query college students, maybe 25% say they've had a major spiritual experience of some kind. Uh, if, you know, so when you start looking around, um, and like, actually, if you look at the incidence of something called exploding head syndrome, which for me very much sounds like an A&P or Kundalini or whatever <laughs> event you want to call it, some kind of energetic something, right. right? That's actually weirdly common, even though it's almost unknown in medicine, because people almost never actually report it to anybody because it's so strange. They don't know what to do with it. But if you actually look at the prevalence data or the, you know, how many people have actually ever had this in their life, it's actually weirdly high. And so the question of how common this is, one way or another, it is vastly more common than the people who want to label this as like anomalous experiences or yeah. uncommon human experiences or like all these labels that people use for 
the, what we call emergent experiences or phenomena. And a lot of them sort of make it sound like the or exotic, you know, states of mind or unusual states of mind. We don't think those are true. Plenty of people have at least some of this sometimes, way more than you might think. Right. And certainly way more than would have the, you know, would ever tell a mental health practitioner. Right. <laughs> yeah. You start telling mental health practitioners, that kind of stuff. They're going to start raising some questions. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> right. Uh, that's too funny, man. So, yeah. So, I mean, this stuff's super common. It's super common. And uh, probably I would say that it, it's, you know, you, you're talking about people that have seen ghosts and people who mm -hmm. have, say that I've had a, a spiritual experience. It's like, yeah, that's probably more common than people who would say anything contrary to that. Right. Yes. And although it's funny. A lot of people have this sort of weird degree of compartmentalization. Take my father. My mm -hmm. father is a, is a Harvard, Yale, Yale, Harvard, Harvard, Yale, Yale, Harvard trained pediatrician. But when he trained at, at Harvard, he was an engineer. He's one of those guys with like the slide rule and the pocket protector with the pens and the like heavy glasses and the collar. That's my dad. Like he, <laughs> he's muggly to the core. And if you say like, do you believe in like, you know, weird spiritual stuff? He'll say, no, of course not. Like that's all ridiculous. Yeah, and then start talking to him about ghosts. And all of a sudden, he'd be like, well, except for ghosts. And then he'll start talking about all his ghost stories and ghost experiences. And you're like, now, wait, did you just not say? <laughs> so a lot of people have this sort of funny thing where the their initial scan, even of themselves, is very materialist, conservative. But then if you start asking nuanced questions about, have you ever done this? Or you ever, you know, like... Like there are a lot of subtle things. Like, did you ever just know who was calling when they called and you all, and you just were able to say, Hey, you know, whoever it is or something like that. And then you start getting like, did you know that this was going to happen? Or did you ever have an intu intuition about someone who's going to get sick or someone who had just died? Or have you ever, you know, and you start asking them about their dream life or you start asking them if like they ever had like new stuff that they couldn't possibly ordinarily have known or something. And, and, you ask enough of that and people will start to tell you stuff. Nearly everybody. Um, it's very yeah. rare that someone's had none of that stuff. Right. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. That's super interesting. Wow. Yeah. I guess the, I've, now I'm just sitting here thinking about it. It's like the majority of people that I've have, have had some sort of experience, you know, whether it's yeah, uh, even, even myself when I was younger, my, my father passed away when I was mm. 20 years old. And I remember we, he wasn't, we weren't really like super, super close, but we were close enough. And I remember just waking up the day he died. I woke up out of a sound sleep and like, was like, I have to call my dad. I've got to call my dad. And I called and my stepmother answered the phone and she's like, he just passed away like five minutes ago. What? Yeah. That exact. That's, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. But that, that's the exact kind of thing. Right. Um, yeah. That's immediately what that's what came to mind when when you talked about that. There's like yeah. that 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 experience in particular was like, I mean, like what are the chances of that, right? Just like I've got to call my dad, and you just missed him, you know? Like, right? Yeah, like, like I don't there. talk to my sister that often, and I suddenly got this feeling like something is horribly wrong. What is horribly wrong? And one of the first calls I made, it's like I don't know what's going on, but something. And I I called my sister, and you know we don't talk that often. And she's like, yeah, I just got out of the hospital with our, our childhood friend, you know, has had just a major stroke and brain bleed and is now in a coma. Oh, no. I just got out of the hospital with them, like just, a, you know, a few minutes ago. Um, you know, somebody I'd known since I was like six. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. I was like, ooh, yeah. 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 And like, I just, like, this is not a feeling I get like, okay, something right. is wrong. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, like it woke me up out of a sound sleep, like, and the first thing, like, sure. I've got to call my dad. Like, yeah. I, you know, it's like I said, we weren't like super close. We didn't talk daily. We didn't, maybe we didn't even talk like every week, but mm -hmm. you know, something just, Hey man, wake up, make the call. Yep. Yeah. Super crazy. Right. I mean, that's just, this stuff happens and you know, it probably happens more frequently than we give it credit for. One thing that, um, and I don't know if you have any insight on this, but one thing that I've kind of been doing some research on for a couple of years and just in my spare time, just because I think it's fun, is the the kind of overlap between DMT and and schizophrenia. And so there's this like large overlap of it, like DMT hallucinations presenting very much the same way that um, schizophrenic hallucinations present. Even a lot of the same quote unquote entities that people see on DMT mm. are very similar to the ones that people experience that are exhibiting symptoms of schizophrenia. And so again, it's like, well, which, you know, which is it, you know, is it psychosis? Is it something else? Like, you know, is this schizophrenia 
like lend lend itself to the idea that maybe that's a an overproduction of DMT in the body. Like who knows, right? But there's this weird like overlap there between the two, and, and that I've found kind of fascinating for a while now. Yeah, and then funny things like I keep pondering the notion like Stanislav Graf apparently believes there are some people with um, psychosis or schizophrenia who might get better with LSD. Now, obviously, anybody out there in podcast land who's thinking they're going to try this, please don't on my recommendation. <laughs> I merely report uh, one person's speculations. You should do your own research and make good choices. And that might be a terrible one. I have no no clue. But that, that there are major researchers who think those kinds of things and think that that may actually help we're paradoxically push people back in a better direction or help them discover something that helps them shift you know, is something that, you know, is out there as something that really should be studied better that we get from the first wave. Yeah. And yeah, but absolutely. Don't, don't do that though. Yeah, <laughs> You're listening right. to me. Please don't take LSD to try to cure your schizophrenia. Right. This is, please this is please not consult the EPRC about that before you make any decision. No, actually the EPRC is not even prepared to answer that because we don't, right. we don't have enough data. Like someone, you know, someone should probably do a trial or, you know, like an observational study or something. I'm sure there are people out there with schizophrenia who are taking LSD. You could see if it made them better. But, you know, how do you do, how do you study that kind of stuff ethically is a real question right. that needs serious thought. Right. Well, it seems like you guys are kind of starting to at least open up the dialogue about kind of moving into that sort of territory, right? Sure. Yes. And, and with regard to that, I mean, obviously that, that particular study is not one right. that I, I just mentioned <laughs> right. in the context of the conversation, it's yeah, not yeah. actually on our roadmap at the moment, <laughs> uh, but we do have studies like, you know, we have the largest study in the world of uh, what happens when people take a psychedelic and they don't land right. Like, what does that look like? What helped them? What didn't? That's the Challenging Psychedelic Experiences uh, project that you can find with Jules Evans and his team and people at Greenwich University. Uh, so that's that's a cool one that um, Emergence Benefactor is the charity that supports the EPRC. We we administer that grant and are very happy that we've ha you know been able to find a bunch of money for that one. So that's exciting, groundbreaking research. Very nice. And, yeah. Yeah, I was going to I was going to ask about phenomenology of uh, we've got people doing DMT and 5-MeO DMT and thinking about like what brain centers are involved. What, how does this compare to quote unquote ordinary consciousness? What are the similarities and differences across people and how do what we see on scanners relate to people's experiences to help us elucidate the underlying mechanisms and structures that may have something to do with how these molecules operate and what they do. Very cool. And you, and you guys are doing this work. I mean, it's not just one center. You guys are spread oh, no, it's a lot of places everywhere. I, I noticed you were doing some, uh, some work with, with Vanderbilt and, uh, and uh, yeah. I, I can't remember all the other places. The Vanderbilt stuck out because it's closest to home for me, obviously. Yeah. Harvard, Yale, yeah. Brown, you know, at Imperial College, London, Oxford, Cambridge, lots of places. Right on. Yeah, and, keep going on. Yeah, well, I'm sure you could. I was going to ask. So, so, where, how does how does this get funding? I mean, obviously, it, <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> who's funding? That's the this? question. That's the big question. Right. <laughs> that's the co that's my co on these days is where the heck does the money come from? <laughs> and by the way, let me give a shameless plug for the EPRC. If you out in podcast land have any idea where the heck the money comes from, you let us know because we found some. We can find some. Right. There are there are people who care about this. It's mostly crypto money, weirdly enough. Or uh, maybe not weirdly enough, is like you know, new people who have done well in crypto and and uh, care about this is where like yeah, ninety percent of the money comes from. No, at, at least it's moment. coming. At least at least for emergence benefactors and some of the stuff. Now people do get grants for this. There are people who've gotten NIH grants and various grants at other countries to do this kind of research. And so you can find also people from private foundations like Beckley Foundation, Bial Foundation, um, Templeton, places like that. So there are people who give a little bit and. But it's not nearly enough. We need we need vastly more to do this properly, like just vastly more cash to really have a shot at this. And what are we actually? I mean, you know, so we can do studies. You know, if we get you know, you know, a few thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars or forty, fifty thousand dollars, we can do studies with those, and that's great. And we're super appreciative of of any size donation to us. Thank you, and believably grateful. But then here's the funny thing. To really do this right, we need about 20 to $40 million a year budget. So we need the full budget of, of an organization like Templeton, which can give out that kind of grant money every year. And we need to sustain, sustain that for a few decades to really do this research right and properly and really establish this on a good foundation to be uh, you know, a highly accepted and valid part of the clinical mainstream.
Right on. Well, uh, yeah. at least at least you've got the ball rolling, right? Like it, 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 the work right. has started, it's being done, which is so much better than it was before. Like th- these conversations didn't even exist 10 years ago. That's true. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, it's a little coming. bit in the psychedelic space, right? You had maps, right? Right. You had the transpersonal kids. I appreciate all of them. We, sh- we got, you know, this is a conversation we're building on and other groups. It's not like, you know, the TM kids have been doing research and meditation for a long time. But an honest treatment of risk benefits and alternatives of highs, lows, weirds, and plateaus of the all the strange things that can go right, the things that can go wrong, and all of that, um, we are very much not necessarily pro or con any of these things. We're pro, or, pro and con high quality data for people to be able to make good choices to facilitate good outcomes, which is different from like, hey, everybody should do psychedelics or you right. know, whatever. <laughs> everybody go sit a 10-day Vipassana retreat. Exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Like, please, yeah, don't do that either. <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't mean, know. I mean, go do complicated. it. Just to go in with eyes open and, and yeah. an appreciation of of the wide range of things that can happen. And, uh, you know, I still refer people to 10-day Vipassana retreat. Oh, no, I, I can, I'm going to go sit one in May. I love those there things. There you go. They're, they're amazing. But just just if you go in, go in with your eyes open, what the range of possible effects is. And, right. yeah, and have some some tips and tricks and technologies in place to help deal with those. If right. you don't get all the support you might otherwise need. And you won't. Not at the not at the Vipassana retreat, <laughs> unfortunately. And that is one my one of my only like critiques of the Vipassana retreat is because yeah. it is so much intensive practice over such a short amount of time that yeah. that a lot of you know a lot of things can come up. A lot of these emergent mm-hmm. phenomena can can ar- arise for you. Uh, sure. You know, I've crossed the A and P on a Vipassana retreat. I've had some weird Kundalini experiences. I've mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I've, I've run the gamut of experiences sitting retreat that I think a lot of people just really aren't prepared for. You know, they sure. get again, they get this idea. And the clinical right? mainstream isn't prepared for that's for certain. Oh, absolutely not. They suck at this. Yeah, one hundred percent. And I, I feel like you know, people like ourselves who are in this unique position of like knowing a little bit, like, hey, this is the stuff that can happen, and having some experience with that puts us in a uh, a better position to be able to actually talk to people about these things than even the most quote unquote trained professionals. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. The average clinician has almost no idea what the range of effects is, and not only like what the what the strange things that can go kind of sideways or weird or surprise people or not ready for or not prepared for but also the healing potentials the amazing transformational capacities that some of these experiences properly held normalized and supported could lead to mm. very deep insights and transformations of consciousness and unfortunately the you know the insight tradition exists in a context of a clinical mainstream that basically says is crazy needs meds as their right. first second and third tier response <laughs> That is unfortunate. You know, and it's not like meds aren't an important, you know, tool to have in the toolbox. Sometimes sure. you really need them. Absolutely. I get it. But right. the, to have them is nearly the only tool is a serious problem, particularly, you know, you shut down someone's insight process that might have led to something great. And exactly how to know when to do that and when to give meds and when to try meditative techniques and grounding and diet and all that stuff. Like we, nobody's ever given the clinical mainstream the data they need to really make those decisions in a in an evidence-based way, in a standards of care supports it kind of way, in the textbooks and your training supported it kind of way. Mm-hmm. And so that's what the EPRC is here for, is to help them, everybody do better when it comes to this process. Man, I love that. I, I, I just, I absolutely just adore this project for that. You know, because- Thank you. Because these are, these can be really debilitating experiences. Oh yeah. I mean, they can be super, super high or super, super low. You know, yeah. I've gone through that, just running through the whole progress of insight. Myself, like the, the dark nights that I've been through, like that shit was terrible. It was awful. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. awful. And again, thank you. Honestly, thank you for helping me uh, kind of like move through at least one of those. If it wasn't like for one of our conversations that we had, I would probably still be stuck in that shit and wouldn't be where I'm at today. So big thanks to you. I really appreciate everything you've done for me personally and everything you do for everybody else. Cause you are, you know, your shit, man. And like, uh, you know, you catch a lot of shit on the internet, but uh, <laughs> I think you're, I think you're an amazing guy and uh, you've, you've helped me tremendously. So. Well, thank you. I, I want to give a, sh- not only thank you for being a part of the journey and being a part of the conversation and, you know, being a co-adventurer on the path, but also like, thanks to all these people and all these like oh, yeah. people who helped figure this stuff out long before I got here. Right. I wasn't right. smart enough to figure this stuff out and figure out the maps and the techniques and the tricks and all the stuff to do. I could follow instructions and read and learn and share the journey and learn from my, you know, fellow co-adventurers. 
but you know, I, I wasn't that good. These people were, these people yeah. did figure it out. <laughs> they know though. they're the originator. So like, right. thank you, you know, old traditions and wisdom people who carried this forward for us for thousands of years. And the people who taught me, right. right? You know, thanks to Christopher Titmus and Sharda and Norman and all these, you know, Bonte Gunratana and Bill Hamilton and all these other people who were just super useful. Thank you. Man. Yeah. 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 Thank you to everyone who has done this work, right. Who has put, I mean, and in various spiritual traditions, cause they can all kind of point, you know, and all paths lead here, right. Like <laughs> They all kind of point to the same thing at the end. If you follow it to fruition, they're all kind of pointing at the same thing in my experience. And one of the, again, to just come back to the linguistics issue is like all of these traditions and all these, you know, spiritual traditions and even psychedelic use, we all kind of have these very similar experiences, but because the the language is so vastly different from, from practice to practice and from experience to experience, it's like, how do we sort through this? How do we sift through all these different terms and, and finally get to a language where we can say, oh, we've been saying the same thing the whole time. We just are using different terminology. Well, so that kind of, you point to what we call a rough clinical perennialism of that kind of, there clearly are some commonalities and some common pathways and some common shared experiences across these traditions. Not that things can't look a little different sometimes right. too, they can. And that intersection of culture and interpretation of, and what honestly is different is, is I think hopefully going to continue to be a very rich conversation. I want, don't want to say I have all the answers to that one. That's an, that's an old one. Um, but that that sense that there is a commonality and that there could be language. So the language thing is also very important to the EPRC. So we, we have a number of, of like core ethical concepts because our goal is to scale this globally to people around the world and to have people everywhere be able to benefit from some kind of at least basic knowledge of some of this theory, right? And so that comes to us from a bunch of different traditions. And mm -hmm. So linguistic scalability is one of those. So like what kind of language scales? I, I mean, unfortunately, most of our traditions, our language doesn't scale, right? We, we don't have terms that the clinical mainstream are going to adopt or appreciate, like Kundalini, the word you just use there, you know, A and P. Like what are the chances those end up in, in the ICD-11 or something or the DSM? <laughs> Very low. Right. You know, the transpersonal kids have been trying with that one for 60 years or whatever, and, and it hasn't scaled. And I don't think it's going to like, I don't know how many more decades we need to do that experiment. But we do need some kind of language that talks about these energy like experiences, as they're called, you know, in out of the Brown University literature out of Cheetah House and Willoughby Britton and Jared Lindell and their work, and Nathan Fisher, etc. So figuring out what's the terminology that does scale, that's not dogmatic, that's not like owned or proprietary by a religion, that's just descriptive in the same way that like biological taxonomy is or chem you know, chemistry nomenclature, those kinds of things. We're looking for that kind of terminology that does scale. And so the linguistic issue is a critical one that we have to get right. And that'll have to be built up over a long time by consensus, just like they did it for the other fields where now they have standardized global terminology. So if you look at the 17 and 1800s in mathematics and, and biological taxonomy and stuff, there were, you know, decades of rich debates of what do we call this stuff? Okay, let's have that in this world and then come to an agreement of what we call it and move forward with that shared lexicon. Right. And yeah, and this, this work that's being done with the EPRC is, is so new in a sense. I mean, it's, it's old stuff, but it, the bringing it all together is such a new thing that it's like, yeah, that's going to take a while, right? That's not going to take a while. Not, not something that's going to happen overnight. We're trying to compact thousands of years of spiritual and mystical and, and modern psychology and, and like turn it into this, this sculpture that we can actually look at and go, oh, now we have a thing. <laughs> but it's, it's, oh, yeah. it's getting all of the piece, the bits and pieces and being like, okay, now we can make the thing. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. That's hard work. That's, that's hard yeah. work in itself. I mean, that's a whole project in and of itself. Sure. And then the other one, the other big key EPRC point is something we call ontological agnosticism or neutrality. Hmm. So like a lot of the previous traditions that have tried to do this are like, we're going to make the whole world believe in cosmic consciousness. <laughs> you sure? <laughs> really? You sure you're going to do that? Right? Good luck. Because <laughs> um, people have been trying that for 2,800 years. I went back to the axial age. And these debates were being had then. You had your monists and your dualists and your cosmic consciousness people and your people was all void, your materialists, weirdly. You know, you had you had all those debates. There's nothing, people, the soul is a thing. And then, you know, <laughs> separate from the body, there's nothing. Again, Cartesian dualism did not start with Rene Descartes. 
Right. <laughs> it, it's, it's not original to him. Right. But, but so these kinds of considerations, also, we don't think any of that scales. So we're going to stay out of the cosmic consciousness debates. And it turns out clinical medicine, despite all its current problems with this, because it's so comfortable with first person methods, I mean, I've never been able to measure pain or nausea or dizziness or well-being or the feeling of joy, right? You, you could never measure those things, but people could describe them to you and say, or like, something's wrong. Okay, I'll bite. Something's wrong. What's wrong? I don't know. <laughs> something's wrong. I, I had this, uh, I was an intern in Louisville and I had this little uh, diabetes guy who type one diabetes for like 40 years. Uh, he's like 61 or something. He got in his early twenties and he said, uh, he came to me and he said, something's wrong. I said, what do you mean? He said, I don't know. Something's wrong. Something's going wrong. How can you tell? I don't know. Do you have any pain? No. Nausea? No. Sweating? No. Headache? Vomiting? Eh. Numbness? Weakness? Tingling? Anything? No. No, no, no. Something's wrong. I said, okay. I got an EEG of him. I uh, sorry, an EKG, EKG, and uh, like looking at his heart was the my first move because I'm like, okay, I'm a paranoid ER doctor in training, and he was having a heart attack. He had was what we call tombstones on on his EKG, these big signs of like a massive MI. Oh geez. And like he was just standing there talking to me, and it, like you know, diabetes had fried like everything except the one neuron that was like, hey, we got a problem down here, <laughs> and that was all he could tell me was something was wrong, and that was it. Like. But that was an important bit of signal. And in that same kind of way, you know, with regard to this stuff, you know, you can, you can get, get a good pattern recognition as a clinician, even if you've never had these things. You can go, and what we hope is at the very best is someone go, oh, that's that weird emergent stuff. We don't know what that is, but you go talk to them emergent doctors. They know how to do this, you know, and hopefully we have a <laughs> fellowship where, you know, or some specialty training where we actually have some branch of medicine that owns this. And so we're actually laying all of the conceptual and academic foundations you need to establish a new specialty, which is basically a defined body of knowledge uh, and make it the clear case that it is not well handled by other traditions and figuring out how, how they can actually turn this, what kind of training they need to, to reasonably be able to handle this well and to give them the information they need to. And so that's what we're actually doing with the EPRC is helping to establish a new specialty. Yeah, and that's that's so good. It's so good. I I love that. I, I love that. That's actually a thing that's happening. That we're it's like giving some validation to these these spiritual. But it's like, hey, this is the thing. Like, this is a thing. You're not crazy. I promise you, you're not crazy. Well, you might be crazy. But you might be crazy that's, too. Like, that's funny you could thing. be crazy. Like, you might also be crazy. Like, <laughs> so I'm not gonna. Like you got to be careful here, right? You, you might also be crazy. This stuff can make you kind of functionally nuts, you know. Uh, yeah, it certainly can. <laughs> High level functioning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so then what is crazy and where do you draw the line and what context? And and if so, what do you do about it? And what's skillful and what adds value? And do you have some options other than meds and you're broken for life and some of the stories that people get told? Right. Yeah. You know, I can't I can't tell you how many people I've talked to who who came out of a meditation retreat with some experience that I would consider absolutely stock standard normal insight stuff, mm. you know, totally like important thing that they arrived at through their own diligent practice. And they had the misfortune to tell a family member or a mental health care practitioner or something and ended up this long spiral of you're broken, you'll need meds for life. You know, you're totally screwed what, for stuff. I'd be like, that's no, normal insight stuff. It's not right. Yeah. I mean, you, you hear stories about it all the time, you know, people mm -hmm. going people that are new to meditation, you know, and not understanding the territory and like where mm -hmm. it can go. And right, they, they didn't give informed, important consent. Important, you know, and that's important to be yeah. able to give informed consent. Right, and and have and information. It, where, you know, there's there's several stories about you know people who go sit these like long ten day retreats and then they come out and they're and they're you know their families like oh they were never the same and she killed herself or you know there's all these things that happen. It's like yeah, yeah maybe maybe we need somebody that we can talk to about these things. Maybe there needs to be a field of study that's dedicated right. to this. Or also, I mean, in the same breath, also all the amazing healings and transformations that and too. openings Absolutely. and cool initiations or which whatever I've, you want to call it. Into which the past, I have seen which more also of happen. That. Yeah. Right. Vastly more, obviously. Yeah. Not that both happen. Right. And I've talked to lots of people, you know, on both sides of it and both people who had both. It was like yeah. the worst thing and the best thing I ever did. Like, you know, yeah. I fall in that opinions. camp. Yeah. I'm in sure. that camp. Yeah. And. So, and then the question is, how could they give informed consent to that? How can the clinical mainstream be vastly able to support this? And how can they themselves, as people providing 
situations where people can can undergo these kinds of trainings and have these kinds of experiences? How can they be better at supporting the people who are undergoing this journey in this set of shifts and experiences? How can we help them to do what they do vastly better and lead to vastly better outcomes? That's what we're here for, is to help support them with data and good science and good clinical sensibilities. Yep. That's awesome. If only we can find the money. <laughs> that is a big thing, right? So we found, you know, it's like we found some money, right? And and yeah. that's great. And we have enough to do some studies and some work, but it's it's not enough. So again, if you have a bazillionaire friend or you yourself happen to have unusually deep pockets, please info at ebenefactors.org. We'd be happy to talk with you. <laughs> yeah, somebody, somebody call Elon Musk and send him over to the EPRC. It gets mentioned a lot, actually, in the Elon, you know, Elon's an interesting one because he's done a bunch of ketamine and psychedelics. We know right. that he's talked about that. He's done a bunch of substances. He's almost has certainly had a bunch of these experiences and he would hang in a crowd where people would have these experiences. He mm -hmm. would also know full well that the clinical mainstream sucks at this. He would almost certainly appreciate that this doesn't scale in the way that he might want it to or think might be valuable without a highly, you know, skilled and sophisticated clinical mainstream when it comes to this. And so we hope that people such as and including Elon will reach out to us and appreciate that if they want to make this world a better place, this is a relatively affordable one. You, for much less than you could you know, build a new rocket company, you could change the entire era. Because if you redefine the fundamental relationship between the deep end of human experience, religion, science, medicine, philosophy, and public understanding, that's an era shift. I'm not exaggerating. It sounds like a ludicrous thing to say. It isn't no. the age of enlightenment or the, you know, the reformation or Protestant reformation or whatever it is. These were major shifts that, that had those kinds of level of transformations of uh, culture and society and understanding in them. And if we pull off our project, we will change the era. Again, I don't mean to be like new age and we'll, we'll enter the age of Aquarius or whatever, <laughs> like, but structurally, technically, that yeah. is actually what we we are doing. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a real thing. Yeah, yep. for sure. Well, Daniel, thank you so much for taking the time to have this conversation with me. And uh, I always enjoy talking to you. Always. It's been absolutely delightful. And thanks for sharing the journey and for your own insights and and just being a part of the of the 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 wild process. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I am I am down to help in any way that I can, whatever small part that I can do. I'm uh, obviously more than willing and uh, and uh, I'm here. So, yeah. Thank you. And and those, of, those of you out there who are interested in the work of the EPRC and you've got skills to lend and talent, info at T-H-E-E-P-R-C dot O-R-G. Info at T-H-E-E-P-R-C dot O-R-G. Thank awesome. you so much. Be happy to chat with you. Cool. And you got anything else you want to drop? Any, uh, no? That's good. Cool, man. Yeah. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate you taking the time. Cool. Right. Bye.